Welcome, I'm Darren, and I'll be your guide today as I look at 1991-92 NBA hoops. This was the third year that hoops made NBA cards, or made basketball cards, well, made cards at all. And it was, it was a follow-up to a series of sets that looked very similar. In 1989, they'd made a very innovative looking design for, mainly for basketball, in terms of how they, how they thought about creating a card. By using a key in the middle, they made a very interesting approach to a card that was, that was bold compared to everybody else. It wasn't intricate, it was straightforward. And in 1990, they took the exact same card and they tweaked it a bit and made it a lot better. So the big question, of course, is, well, what are they going to follow up with in 1991? And they seem to have taken the criticism of the key blocking out a lot of the shot because in basketball, the pictures of action are really important because that's, that's the nature of the game. That's what's exciting. They seem to have taken that to heart and gotten rid of the, the space up at the top of the cards and they just opened it wide up. So the card that they followed up with was a, a simple white border around the outside with a big rectangular shot for the image. And apart from a team color on the inside of that, there really wasn't much to this card. You have the name up at the top in the white, and then you have the, the logo that's kind of stuffed down at the, at the, in the corner. But it's the most generic card front probably in the history of cards. I mean, it really is surprising to look at just, just how basic it is. And that was the problem where in the previous two years they had an incredibly distinctive card and here in 1991 they have an incredibly forgettable card it's really kind of weird now the card back seems to be kind of themed on what pro set was doing they did a they rotated the card back to be horizontal they have all the pieces in there with a more simplified version of communicating it than pro set was doing and again they created the ultimate generic basketball card I can't really say much else about it, but that's that's basically kind of what it comes down to. Now I want to pause here and I want to talk about the prototype cards, the promo cards, which I don't usually talk about it, but in this case I do need to note it because of the fact that they had two promo sets, which they refer to as prototypes. They're the exact same cards as the main cards in the set, but each of these two sets has nine cards, but there are 18 players. None of the players are repeated in one set versus the other. So every set has unique players, and the way that you can tell the cards in each set is one of the sets, all of the numbers, one through nine, have two zeros in front of it. So 001 through 009. The other set just has regular numbers like in the set. No, no zeros at the front. So they're just, they're, there's no confusing it because all the cards have prototype written on the back. But the one of the sets has two zeros in the front, the other one has none. So that's how you can tell the nine card set from the nine card set. Having that out of the way, I want to get back to the set now. And the way that they built the set was, it, it was a pr another progression. So every year they were evolving the set a little bit. Early on, the players were all scattered around. They still had coaches and they had all-star cards, but everything was just scattershot. And then they threw in an extension of the card set to get traded cards. In 1990, they rebuilt the set so that it actually had structure. And they pulled everybody together so all the teams were lined up. They had the coaches together, all-star cards together. And then they actually thought about doing a Series 2, which was truncated and handled similarly to the previous year. But they treated it as a miniature Series 2. Well, in 1991, they upgraded to making an actual Series 1 and an actual standalone Series 2. So the two sets actually do coexist alongside each other where they're completely independent. And that's, that means that the way that they thought out of this, the way that they thought out this set was as Series 1, it was its own standalone entity. And then Series 2, it also had its own structure. So Series 1 had to have some additional stuff in it but it also had the structure of it starts off with Atlanta and it goes through Washington. They follow that up with the coaches. So all the coaches are laid out and their cards are exactly the same as the player cards in the main set. And then they have their all-stars tucked in after the coaches. Now here, because of the nature of how they designed the cards, they didn't have the luxury of making the all-star cards look different like they did in 1990. Instead, they have a big team color border on the inside and then a big logo for the All-Star game. The cards do not look sleek and, and sexy because 
the the card the design for the cards just doesn't allow for it so they look kind of clunky and kind of weird but at any rate that's how they did the all-star cards and the team color is for either the east or the west that's that's the nature of it and then they had a, a whole bunch of subsets and these subsets most of them are pretty small if not just one card and the first subset is the team cards and the team cards are literally just team cards. They have, uh, they have a shot on the front that is, it, it really is about the team. I mean, this is not kind of like a, some action scene that you might see with Stadium Club in a few years. This is literally a shot of the team, normally in huddles. But on the card back, it actually tells the history of the team. That's what it does. And so this is one of those educational opportunities for people to, for new fans to learn about the game. So the League Leaders cards was something that this was, for basketball, this was pretty much brand new. And they did two shots on each of the cards. They did the leader and then they, the runner-up. So one and two in each category. And they have kind of a pop art design where they have these big bulky boxes of color, which was just, it was pop art for kids. And this was the theme, as you're going to see, for pretty much all of the subset cards. So they had this set of League Leaders. And then they had some more focus cards like Inside Stuff. Inside Stuff was a set that they had started in 1990. And it is tied in with the TV show, the magazine, all of that. And it's basically looking at behind the scenes. Well, not so much behind the scenes as much as off the court aspects of the players' lives. And here with this Inside Stuff subset, you get to see more of the community activity, the community outreach that some of the players had. They also had a subset for milestones, and this is for players who are reaching some really significant benchmark in the in the record books, either some all-time record or maybe they were number of years that, that they received some awards, something like that. And then they had their class of, and this looks at players who were basically at the end of their career. It looks back at their rookie year. So this is this is a um, this is cool to see the players who have already had their storied careers and they're coming to a close. And it's significant because you had Magic Johnson and you had Larry Bird who were sunsetting in their careers. For the most part. And then they had Stay in School. And Stay in School is actually a subset that appears both in Series 1 and in Series 2. Just a couple of cards in each set. And these cards are basically built around, again, it's about community outreach. But this is about more of a player-based community outreach as opposed to putting together a special school or some special program to help out a community. This is more the educational side of it. And then they had two standalone cards. One was about the 100-year bas basketball centennial. And this was a really significant thing because in sports, there are it's very unusual for there to be a beginning time of a sport where you actually know it. You know where it was, you know who it was, you know why it was, you know what it was. We know exactly when basketball was started because there was a day when somebody invented the sport and had the first game. I mean, it really is unusual. And so this was a cool quality to basketball that the NBA really wanted to celebrate and really all of basketball wanted to celebrate it. So they had this card that it either reminded people, or in most cases, it educated people like myself about the beginning of basketball. It's this card that's the reason why I know about the, the invention of basketball. It educated a whole generation of kids to what, to what happened. And again, to how cool it was that it got started. And then they have a celebration card, which is a David Robinson card, where he is basically saying, look, just don't drink. I know that you're going to be celebrating whatever, and you're going to want to drink. Don't do that. That's what it was. It was a stay off alcohol card. And then they have a couple of checklists. And after all of that, now we move on to Series 2. So with Series 2, you have the traded players, and then you have a series of cards called Supreme Court. This is a series of cards. This is a subset where every single team has two players featured. So this is the, the cream of the crop. And it also allows teams that aren't doing very well for those fans to still be able to enjoy the players on their team as well. So it's a very egalitarian setup. 
and it really helps to kind of bring the fans together and feel the feel the the highlights of the league across the entire league which is a really cool card set and the cards do feel like these players really are significant and they had team cards again so in series one they had team cards every single team had a card that talked about the team and on the front had a picture of the team well in series two they did cards that were like what they had done in the previous year these are art cards, and so every single team is represented by one picture, drawn by one of multiple artists. But on the back, instead of being a checklist the way that they had done it in 1990, in this case, it's actually a breakdown of all of the stats of the players for the season. So you get to see the statistical breakdown of the entire roster. And for an analog time like this, this was great. You hardly ever saw it. So you got the ability to see across the entire league the, the productive output of the players on every single team. Now, the statistics do flag any time a player had been traded away. So this is the statistics for the team's performance. And if a player left the team, then they're just saying, well, this is what the player had contributed. So any player who was added to the team, their stats are not here because they don't matter. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of looking back, not a way of looking forward. That's the way that these cards were, that's the way they were laid out. Then they have the all-time active leaders. And this is a subset that looks at players who were reaching the, the they were the dominant players statistically of the active league. So they weren't the all-time record holders, except when you look on the back, they actually list the top 10 all-time record holders and they flag which of those players were still in the league. So you can see what active players or players who had been active in the previous season, you get to see where they stand in the all-time records. But that's what this is looking at. It's not looking at the all-time record holder. It's looking at the, the highest player in each statistical category who's still playing and then you get to see where they, they show up in the stats below. Simple enough. And then they did another set of cards looking at the NBA Finals. It's again, like the 1990 set, it's themed around a newspaper. And yet, unlike in 1990, where they did a black and white image on the front, here at least they have it in color, which is very thankful. And then at the end of this, this little subset, they have a card that is celebrating the championship. However, unlike the Detroit Pistons, here they're just showing Michael with the trophy because, well, that was the storyline. Michael finally won his NBA championship. The very beginning of quite a run of it, but that was this is kind of the most descriptive shot you can have, which is the whole, the whole NBA was looking at this as Michael's shot to win his championship, and he did. What better shot to have? And then they have their draft picks, their lottery pick cards. Uh, again, like the previous year, but in the previous year, they had formal shots that looked they were, like they were all taken from the draft. Well, in the case here with the 1991 set, they had more of an action orientation. Not all the shots are action shots, but some of the shots are action shots or trying to get into that phase. So these are shots that are intended to be either portraits that are focused on the player entering the NBA, or it's saying, look, they're here. So these cards are a lot more energetic and these are the cards where I like the pop art design. I mean, I like the Supreme Court cards too, but in this case, this whole card with the bright colors, it, it really is designed for a youth audience and that's where, the, that's where the whole design aesthetic really comes full circle. So these cards I think look really good. In the set, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of another card, another subset or another set anywhere in this card set that looks as good as this. These are the ones that I think absolutely hit it out of the, out of the ballpark. But probably the closest in terms of competing with this for a good card design is the last subset that they have, which is their Olympics cards. So, 1991-92, we're heading into the Dream Team. And NBA Hoops and Skybox, they won the opportunity to make the Dream Team cards. So, why not put them into their Series 2 card sets? But not just the Dream Team, they wanted to celebrate the Olympics. So they made a card set which looks at every single player who was active in the NBA through 1991 who had been on one of the Olympic teams. And so it starts actually with Walter Davis in 1976. That's, 
the first Olympic team that we have celebrated here. And then the next one is 1984 for many different reasons. And every single card, they have, they have four Olympics shown. Obviously the Dream Team, but they have the 76, the 84, and the 88. And the card sets are built around all the active players who had been on that team. So any player that had been on that team but was not still playing in the NBA, they're not featured in the set. But also any Dream Teamer who had been on one of those teams is not in the set. So that means that Michael Jordan is not in the 84 set, and David Robinson is not in the 1988 set. And the cards have three different card backs. So the 1986 and the 1984 cards, they have more of a yellow card back. And then it's very much a bronze color for, or a tan color for the 88. And then when you get around to the Dream Team cards, those have a blue card back. So that's the color that they have for, for all of the Dream Team cards. And the, with the Dream Team players, they have the first 10, the first team and second team selections. Uh, all of the players are featured in there. So the alternates are not yet included. It's just the first 10 players, and they have the three coaches as well. And that builds out the, the last portion of the set, a couple of checklists, and there you have it. You have the 1991-92 NBA hoop set. It's a lot. There's a lot in this because subsets were the key. Inserts were still very new. They still weren't being done very much. But that doesn't mean that inserts weren't actually happening. There were a few that were that were done here with the set. And the first one is the Naismith card. Now the Naismith card is similar to the card that we had with the Centennial. It has Dr. Naismith on it. It's talking about the Centennial. But where the card in the set was talking about the invention of basketball, the insert card, CC1, this card actually is built entirely around Dr. Naismith, talking about him. That's the whole point of this card. So this was, a, this was a card that it was randomly inserted. You didn't see it very often, but it was a, an SP card that you could get out of packs. In Series 2, they had a randomly inserted SP card that was kind of like a title card for the Dream Team. It is a gold finished card. It has a metallic look to it big logo in the middle and then on the card back it talks about why the dream team is there and why it's so, so so special an unnumbered card but those were the two cards that were sp cards in the sets but they also had sendaways one of them was the centennial card it was a card built entirely around the centennial instead of being about the invention of the, of the game it was celebrating a hundred years of basketball and they also had one other that was more of a rapper redemption, which was their head of the class card. And the head of the class card looks at the, the six rookies that were the statistical leaders. So these were the guys who everybody was really looking forward to. Three on the front, three on the back, small shots of each player, some basic stats at the bottom. And all of these cards are serial numbered out of 10,000. This was very, very unique. At this time in 1991, there were almost no cards that had been individually serial numbered. But here with this card, this is one of the very few that was serial numbered, and it's not a handwritten serial number, it's actually a printed serial number. So this was a wrapper redemption that you could send away and get. But that's not to say that they didn't actually have proper inserts, actual insert sets. It's just they didn't do it in regular packs. In blister packs, they had a special insert set in Series 1 of the Slam Dunk Champions. So the Slam Dunk competition had been a very storied event and really an amazing event through the 1980s. By the 19, early 1990s, it was starting to lose some of its steam because all of the really cool dunks were out of the way. And the next chapter was nobody knew where it was going to go. But also, there was a changing of the guard where the really exciting slam dunk competitions where you had Kenny Smith and Spud Webb and you had Michael Jordan and, and Walker and Wilkins and all of these players who came out and just had really spectacular, made the event truly a, a spectacular experience across the board. That had come to a close and we now had a whole new generation coming in. So the NBA Hoops wanted to do kind of a celebration of the great years of the slam dunk competition. So they put together this insert set, which was a celebration of the winners of each one. And you get a shot from one of their dunks and you see which years they won. Really cool. And then for series two, they had their all-star MVPs. 
So in this case, it's built the same way. Any player who had been the MVP of the All-Star Game, it showed what years they had been in and them holding the trophy or you know, basically that. These cards actually do have a team color based upon what team they were on when they won the All-Star Trophy. And these cards were really special at the time because most people didn't buy blister packs. So those few of us who did buy these blister packs got insert cards that nobody else had. There, the marketplace was not healthy enough and the dialogue between collectors wasn't healthy enough for everybody to know about it. There were lots of rocks that things were hidden on at this time and this was one of those really cool things to stumble upon and you find it and you, you're wondering why nobody else has found it but you're kind of lucky to have found it. So that's what these insert cards were. And then NBA Hoops also had a couple of other traditions that they were doing and one of those was their night sheets. So night sheets had been invented in 1989. In 1990, they expanded out to have whole sheets of cards that they gave out at games. Well, in 1991, they did the same thing. So you have a big sheet of cards, they're all perforated, and it's basically the whole team. And then there's, I think there's always an advertisement on it because somebody's got to be sponsoring it to order the cards to be printed and to be tied in with the event. So you have a couple of cards that are in some way related to an advertisement. The rest of them are just cards basically from the set without numbers, but once again, with perforations. So they're very easy. This is a very easy one to recognize because they're the only cards without numbers. They also did a tie-in with McDonald's. And the tie-in with McDonald's was because McDonald's was teamed up with the Dream Team, with the Olympics, because the McDon McDonald's was always a part of the Olympics. So they teamed up with NBA Hoops so that in McDonald's they had packs of cards for a special small set of both NBA players and the Dream Team players themselves. These cards do look different than the main cards in the set in terms of the picture. The picture is different and on the card back they have a different number that's in a basketball. So the basketball is the giveaway of the McDonald's release and it's a truncated set, very small set, which also includes the same 10 players on the Dream Team as well as Chuck Daly and they have a team card at the end. And this was, this was a, uh, this I believe is the first time they ever did packs of cards at Burger King, McDonald's, at any place like that. So it was an opportunity for those of us who collected cards to go in and feel like we were collecting cards literally at McDonald's. And I remember really pressuring my parents to go and eat at McDonald's more, which for us, we didn't do that. That was, that was a big waste of money. We would do it every once in a while. So for me, this was, this was a great opportunity that was really fun on those rare occasions when I actually got to do it. Um, but yeah, they, so they had these cards. And then the only other thing they did was their 100 stars. They once again did this in 1991. And with these cards, like in the previous year, same card design as the main cards in the set, except they have a bronze finish around the outside, this time with the metallic bronze on it, where they, you know, instead of the regular white, the metallic bronze really made these cards look so good. And the cards are numbered, renumbered because only have 100 cards. And that is the set. That is what they did for 1991-92 NBA hoops. It is a lot. And it's a lot because we were at a transition time. In just a couple of years, SP cards are gone. Subset cards are basically gone. And we've we've built the entire industry to be around straightforward cards in the main set and a lot of parallels and a lot of inserts. But this is in that high period where we were right in the middle and there were a lot of things to still discover, as you can see. 1992, things would start to get cleaned up. I'm going to look at that, obviously, separately. Um, in, in the meantime, I hope that you've, you've followed along and you've, um, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Um, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Check out my other videos. And thank you very much for watching.